Yeah, well, it's a real pleasure to be here and I didn't realise I was kicking off the annual series, so um, I hope I uh, live up to that role. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today um, about a few projects that we've been running at UCL over the last few years. And it's more of a kind of show and tell exercise, really. Um, it's not a lot of theory and you may also note that it's kind of a bit light on evaluation and we might cover that in questions because that's an issue that we are trying to develop a bit further. But hopefully as the first kick off this might, if nothing else, be a kind of, you know, light entertainment uh, for your lunchtime. So the idea, I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of bottom-up infrastructure, which is what the EPSRC gave me a research fellowship to look at for five years. Uh, and I'm sort of coming to the end of that fellowship. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about three projects that fit loosely within that remit. Uh, the first one uh, was a uh, project which started by looking at the water, energy, food nexus, but instead of looking at it from a kind of supply side infrastructure point of view, said, what if we actually started with the water, energy, food nexus in people's homes and designed out from there? So hence the title, Engineering Comes Home. The next case study that I'll talk to you about followed on from that, which took similar kinds of design processes uh, to a community very local to us uh, at UCL. The Summerstown community is literally across the road uh, from my office. Uh, and that was a community group that wanted to look at how might they get some better air quality measures and interventions uh, into their local plan. So um, in terms of infrastructure, that project didn't itself specifically deal with infrastructure, but that is a community that is massively impacted by really big infrastructure projects that have been ongoing for about 20 years now and with no end in sight. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about the first case study coming out of a a big NERC program uh, funded under the Regional Impact of Science of the Environment program. Uh, the Community Water Management for Livable London is, has, is called Camellia as its acronym. I know there's a fine art to getting from those words <laughs> into the name of a flower or a woman, which is what you seem to have to do for any successful uh, research proposal. But Community Water Management or Camellia is, um, is led by Imperial College, it involves us, BGS and Oxford, uh, looking at integrated water management in London, but again, taking a bottom-up, community-based perspective to that problem. So I'm gonna, in turn, show you what, what each of those uh, case studies is about. You'll see a bit of how things are developing along the way. You'll see a bit of a, you know, logic of a structure to a process. Uh, and you'll also see this effort to try and bring engineering science, engineering tools into the hands of communities uh, so that they can actually start to have uh, an informed, technically grounded uh, input into decision making about infrastructure uh, in their neighbourhood and their city. So bottom-up infrastructure, and this is the kind of overall um, purpose of my research fellowship. And it was it's always kind of a relief when you pull up a slide like this and go, oh yeah, actually, that's sort of what we're doing. Um, so the idea is that we look at infrastructure provision rather than something you do to or for people, but actually can you directly engage communities in design and decision making about infrastructure. And the hypothesis is that that will then improve resilience and sustainability of those cities, of those systems within the urban environment. And part of the justification for this kind of way of thinking is that when we talk about resilience, we, we know that resilience is a very broad concept that has its origins in ecology and engineering, people talk about it in psychology, there's a lot of literature about social and community resilience. But certainly in our policy making areas, 
And indeed, in much of our research, there's like a box around engineering and systems sustainability. We talk about inter interdependence and you know, resilience measures. And then there's another box, um, certainly in policy, for community resilience. And that's about, often that's about how do people respond post-disaster. So how do communities you know, all rally around with the blitz spirit to show their resilience after something terrible has happened? So the kind of research question is, what happens if you actually try and bring those two together? Do you end up with better, more resilient, sustainable uh, infrastructure systems? And then also, what other benefits might there be by people starting to think and talk and even design their own infrastructure? And within the research program, I'm taking um, infrastructure and community engagement all across the scale. So from, uh, this is Repowering London, who are a uh, community energy provider. So that's very much a bottom-up people putting solar cells on the roofs of their social housing estate and forming a cooperative to uh, benefit from selling that power. Um, a model that is being somewhat undermined by changes in feed in tariff policies, but uh, it's still a really interesting kind of way of people actually getting involved in doing infrastructure. Uh, up to the you know, uh, Tideway, HS2, the really big national, nationally significant infrastructure projects. And community engagement is clearly a massive issue for them. How are they doing it? What are they doing well? You know, what could they do better? What does it look like from both sides of the hoardings as to how well that kind of infrastructure, that is, those engagement programs work? So I'm not going to be talking about the really big end of infrastructure today. The examples that I am going to do is talk about is more these kind of people, people in London, in their communities. Uh, two of the examples are in social housing communities. One is a place-based neighbourhood. Uh, and what are they doing and how can we... Um, as researchers, we're kind of experimenting with methods that we're hoping then might uh, have some broader relevance and be taken up by designers, local authorities, um, the, the infrastructure companies themselves. So, as I mentioned, you know, one of these kind of motivations was just to say, well, if we're talking about resilience in these different domains, let's try and bring them together. But there are other reasons why you might want to involve communities in infrastructure is because infrastructure is really important to how we build cities. And there are really, you might get to very different outcomes, whether you take a bottom-up or a top-down approach. You know, if you think it is just the role of the engineering experts and their computer models and their international finance to build big systems, you, know, you can get a very different outcome than if you think it's about a bunch of people on a social housing estate getting together and creating their own energy. Is it, and, and again, that has technical kind of implications. Do you get bespoke, customised, but possibly not, in engineering terms, super efficient uh, bits of technology and infrastructure? Uh, or do you get the, um, you know, Rolls-Royce super engineering that, you know, we celebrate uh, so much in our disciplines and departments? And again, at two ends of the extreme, because it's not, um, I'm not sure that, you know, there, there's a firm continuum in between here, but, you know, the extremes are empowered local residents feeling like they're actually making a difference in their city and feeling like they can make a difference to uh, big issues like climate change, uh, or you can end up with very alienated communities, um, such as many of the people along uh, the proposed train line. Um, so infrastructure itself then creates these, you know, very exciting opportunities to engage communities uh, in this technical work of creating cities uh, and in particular creating livable cities. So that it's not just about delivering a train line, it might be about improving mobility but then also improving uh, air quality, improving walkability, improving kind of greening and, you know, the local experience uh, of living in an environment. So first up is the Engineering Comes Home project. And this 
is, it was probably about 2015 when we did this. So this project was um, a pilot project as part of a manufacturing the future design call. Um, unsurprisingly, it didn't, didn't get the full round of funding, but we did, we had a good time with the, um, with the pilot because this isn't really manufacturing. Um, but we were, it was about design, engineering design was the kind of call and we managed to um, get ourselves into the pilot stage. So, um, so it was a collaboration between UCL, uh, Newcastle, a small internet of things startup uh, from Berlin called II Lab, uh, and over the air analytics, um, Pete Melville Shreve from Exeter. Um, that's a spin out company from his NGD, which was on rainwater harvesting um, at Exeter University. Um, so this was the project that we said, we'll start with looking at the water energy food nexus. And we think about those three things coming together in, you know, big power stations needed to pump water from big dams to irrigate farms, you know, in, in massive industrial scale agriculture uh, and in energy for desalination plants and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, we said, well, the other place that the water energy food nexus comes together is when you cook a potato in your kitchen. You know, it's water, energy and food coming together <coughs> right there. Um, engineers typically don't hang out with people while they're cooking potatoes um, or anything else. Um, so, but we thought, well, what if, what if we just took a little bit of engineering into that kind of realm and looked out rather than our big systems uh, kind of down view? Um, and then, if we do that, it kind of then makes sense to involve those people who, you know, you might be hanging out in their kitchen uh, to then kind of say, well, let's think about how we might, what are these systems that are delivering these services to you that enable you to cook a potato or bathe your children or do your laundry? Um, how, how could things be different? Um, and what else might that mean for your community? Um, but the real kind of point, because it was an engineering design um, research project, was can we then create tools that other designers can use to do this kind of work with communities? The site for the case study uh, is the Meakin Estate. The, Meakin, the landlord for the Meakin Estate is the same as for the Kipling Estate, which is the third project, the Camellia project that we're going to talk about. Uh, they're a tenants management organisation called Leather Market, JMB, and TMOs have had a bit of a bad rap, um, but this is a really good one. This is actually a really, like a truly tenant-led housing uh, organisation um, with a very strong TRA um, uh, organisation and very strong kind of tenants representation on the board of the management organisation. Um, they're in London Borough of Southwark, sort of about 10 minute walk south of London Bridge Station. Um, and I guess it's 1930s kind of construction. It's been through various upgrades over the years. And one of the reasons why it was timely for us to be talking about infrastructure was they, at the time that we were doing the project, they were going through an upgrade of their, their district heating, their central heating um, network. So people already thinking about infrastructure and systems. Uh, and like any social housing estate, it's a combination of um, tenants who are still properly social tenants. Uh, and then some of those have been sold through right to buy. So some people live as leaseholders having taken up the right to buy. Some people are tenant, are private tenants of people who, private le, private leaseholders and, you know, others through the kind of various chains of property sales <clears throat> that have gone on through those flats. So, so a combination of private and social tenants and, um, and leaseholders who are living in their own flats. So the overall process that we have, um, I think we're not unique in having our engagement process consist of three workshops. Uh, so the magic number of three workshops um, starts with, yeah, so that's the kind of core um, spine to the process and it probably happened over about 12 months. Uh, the, but prior to that, we had uh, Charlotte, who <clears throat> is the co-author of this presentation because she 
uh, has worked on all of these case studies along with me. Um, so Charlotte is an anthropologist. So she was the person who went and hung out in people's kitchens uh, and bathrooms and you know, that, ask them how they use it, didn't actually observe them in their bathrooms, but um, spent time with people finding out how they used water, energy and food, um, and a bit of their kind of previous experience of, you know, other parts of the world they might have lived in, other experiences of, uh, of different ways of dealing with um, those uh, resources. Uh, so we had some kind of background ethnographic research. Uh, we fed into this first co-design workshop, which um, looked at what people's values were and what their kind of thoughts were for possible um, futures that they'd like to explore. We then identified a set of, a, a kind of long list of options and shortlisted those um, to go into the second co-design workshop, which had five possible options and people discussed those, and they discussed them with a life cycle assessment calculator um, so that they could not only talk about, um, well, that might get vandalised or that would be expensive or that won't be maintained kind of um, things from their own experience, but we were also bringing in life cycle assessment data for them to also say, well, that system's going to have a bigger impact on carbon, that one's going to need more water, uh, those kinds of technical information coming into those conversations. Uh, and then the final workshop, so then they selected one uh, system that they wanted to take forward and we took that into a third workshop which again then had another kind of detailed calculator where people could bring in some engineering calculations again in their conversations about what it, where it might go and what it might look like on their estate. Uh, throughout we kind of documented it through videos and reflections uh, and yeah there were various kind of bits of evaluation that uh, went along the way too. So as I said that first um, the first workshop was about sort of opening people up to the topic thinking about um, thinking about different ways of providing water energy and food and what it is that they value about their estate now what it is that they want to see in the future uh, so that gave us, like I said, a long list, but it also gave us some values and priorities that helped us to be able to get that down to five propositions that we thought would be of interest. Now, uh, this photo isn't great, but one of the tools that we designed were these tokens. So it, one of the aims for this was to help people to start to think in a systems way. So we had tokens, so in this case it's got the house icon on there, but we had other icons with sun, water, solar cells, wind turbines, rainwater tanks, different bits of infrastructure, different bits of things. And then people could, on the boards, so they had little magnets on the back of them, we had these magnetic boards, and what you can see here is someone has put together a little story of a system with all these... Uh, hexagon tokens and some pictures of different bits of the estate and pens and whatever. Um, so that in terms of telling a story, they're also telling a story about how things join together. So it's not just isolated bits of kit or isolated, you know, random things like a wind turbine. It's about saying, well, how does that actually fit together in a systems way? When I talk about our challenge of evaluation, I can say that I think I observed people talking in systems ways. I think that might be my, but I couldn't say for sure that that wasn't just my wishful thinking because we'd given them these nice tokens. So that is, um, that is something that in future research, we want to be able to do more of that kind of detailed evaluation. Do these processes actually help people to properly understand how infrastructure works, to properly think in these systems terms? Um, or are we just, you know, seeing what we want to see as researchers? Uh, so then we had a long list of different ideas that people came up with. Uh, we shortlisted those based on feasibility and desirability. And actually the technologies that we came up with, you know, aren't, um, well, I've, like I've just walked past the graphene research. They're not graphene. <laughs> like we're talking about, 
no, at Wormery, we're talking about rubbish compactors, we're talking about fairly kind of basic stuff, but things that people probably had, many people had not known about or thought about these technologies before. Uh, so then the second workshop was to go from those options down to one that people wanted to take forward into more detail. Uh, so first of all, we needed to give people some information about those, so we created a set of fact sheets. We had this life cycle assessment calculator that in their conversations they could look at different environmental and carbon impacts from those different technologies. Uh, and then they went through a process and at the end of the workshop, people selected rainwater harvesting as the technology that they wanted to take forward in their estate. So that's uh, a fact sheet, lots of facts. Um, and this is our life cycle calculator and you can play around with that online. Um, and you will notice in terms of the design, so II Lab did this design, you'll see this consistency coming through that these are hexagons and those icons relate back to the tokens that people were using in the first workshop. So there's a kind of consistency of design and feel and colours and so on, um, which I think is helpful. Um, so people could look through different scenarios and then look at different scales and also time periods. So they could look and say, uh, are we going to involve the whole estate or are we just going to look at like one block? So you could change the number of flats that were involved in the scheme. You could look at your numbers for a week, a month, or I think a day, a month or a year. Anyway, you can um, play around with that should you choose. But the other point about this is that behind this, so. Um, a1 Borion, who's a colleague in civil engineering uh, at UCL, her research area is life cycle assessment. So she did the life cycle assessment numbers that went behind this. So this is not kind of Mickey Mouse stuff, this is like proper uh, data in the inventory that's coming up with these numbers. So, um, so, so these are like absolute numbers, they're not, it's not just about the kind of relative more or less. Um, and then, in a very happy coincidence, um, Pete phoned me up. Pete had some funding from, so Pete Mowell-Sheree from OTA uh, had some funding from Future Cities Catapult or some innovation funding to demonstrate his um, smart rainwater tanks. So Pete's system is a rainwater tank that is connected to the internet, so he can sit in Exeter and in future infrastructure um, water companies or other infrastructure kind of managers can, you, can uh, monitor and control these tanks remotely and it's that idea that um, one of the difficulties with rainwater harvesting as a flood resilience measure is that if the tank's full when your rainwater storm comes through, you don't get any storage benefit. So this is the kind of idea that a lot of people have been thinking about, um, that if you can control those tanks remotely, you can have water available for people to use when they want to in normal circumstances. If you know that there's a heavy rain event coming, you can, dr you can drain the tank, you know, six or 12 hours in advance while the drainage system can still has capacity to cope. Uh, and then you've, you know that you've got the storage there for when the rain event comes along. So, um, but equally you can just remotely kind of monitor how people are using their water and so on. So, uh, so Pete needed an inner London um, location to demonstrate this technology. Uh, and uh, we had the perfect location. So they came and installed, it's not a great photo, but that is Pete's rainwater tank. Um, and... So that, that was also important for us, and this is something that, uh, again, is a feature in the, um, in the Kipling uh, case studies that, particularly working with communities, it's important to be able to actually demonstrate, to give them a physical piece of kit that they can actually see and play with and understand how it works, <laughs> rather than just more kind of fact sheets and blah, blah from us. So uh, we were really happy. We, we already had kind of plans for how we were going to put our own um, inferior rainwater tank in there and we ended up getting, you know, a bells and whistles internet of things rainwater tank. Um, so people could then, prior to the third workshop, they kind of knew what rainwater harvesting was and how it might work. 
Then going into workshop three, we went out with people around the estate and said, where might you put a rainwater tank? Uh, and we, been, in our kind of uh, introduction to this, had said, oh, you know, rainwater might be really good. You can use it for watering your garden. You can use it for washing your bicycles. Uh, and then, of course, people were like, why would you wash a bicycle? But it might be really useful for washing a car, like for normal people, um, <laughs> rather than university nerds. Um, so, so people were quite keen to put, oh, here's a downpipe. And so again, these people probably had never even noticed that there were downpipes on their buildings. And we talked through, well, that downpipe is going into, that's coming from someone's bathroom, so that's dirty water, we can't use that. But, oh, that one comes straight from the roof. Um, and you can see it's going straight into the sewer and, you know, we'd had conversations about then what happens in terms of sewer capacity and combined sewer overflows. So people could then figure out where they thought would be good locations based on the downpipes and also then based on proximity to, for instance, car parks, um, that that might be a useful thing for them to do with the water. And we had, similar to our life cycle assessment calculator, we had a rainwater calculator that calculated how much water that would save and then what impact that would have um, on water discharging into the sewers. Um, and, you know, you see people with clipboards and worksheets and these other kinds of bits and pieces. So we came up with a kind of kit of things that we used throughout that process. Uh, and it's all on a nice website, so you can go and have a look at that. In terms of the evaluation, um, residents had a nice time. Um, we fed them. We paid people to participate in this process. This was the only one where participants were paid. Um, but, you know, I'm going to feel proud when I walk past the tank, which is kind of a nice piece of feedback. Uh, people felt like they learnt some stuff. Um, and it was also kind of a nice community kind of building event. People got to meet their neighbours and they got to have positive conversations about the future of their uh, estate. And so one of the things that was coming out of this, and this is an idea that we are looking to develop further, is this concept of infrastructural literacy. So our hypothesis is that people who participated in this process probably had, particularly with water, probably had like zero concept of how water infrastructure works. But through going through this process, thinking about their own estate, thinking about their own options, actually now have a pretty good um, concept of knowing about uh, literacy, uh, knowing about infrastructure. We don't quite know actually how to measure this thing called infrastructure literacy, but that's something that we're kind of developing and testing as we're going through this process. Uh, and then there were some various different things that we would do differently or, or felt constrained our process. One was, you know, the nature of this kind of community work, you can't specify and pin people down. You have to come and you have to be here at two o'clock on a Saturday because people have lives. So different people kind of came and went and that brought some new ideas, but it also, you know, does make the process. It doesn't necessarily follow a linear kind of uh, path. Um, and also we kind of thought about some of the institutional constraints. So we were doing it in the Tenants and Residents Association and so people were had really strict or had already had some firm ideas about what wouldn't work. So definitely can't grow food because people will steal it or they'll piss on it or it, they'll vandalise it and no one, we can grow flowers but we can't grow food. That's actually not an uncommon thing for people in these kinds of environments. But, um, but yeah, there were some things that we just couldn't go near the conversation because there was like the sort of authorised um, body, the TRA, and that was their line. Um, so the next uh, case study, based on that kind of process, we then um, started in a conversation with residents in, um, in Summerstown. And this is an entirely internal UCL uh, project funded by our EPSRC Impact Acceleration Account. And the scale of the funding, the first project was uh, about 300,000 was the total budget. This one, we're down to 30. And for us, that was actually, that kind of impact acceleration account funding is a really useful thing because it gives you a bit more discipline that we know that we can't do these highly resourced 
um, projects, like no one is going to spend £300,000 designing a rainwater tank. Like that would just be ridiculous. In the commercial world, no one's going to pay for that. But if we can demonstrate that our processes actually still work at much lower levels of funding, um, then we might be starting to get to a point at which we can have more impact. Uh, so Summerstown is, is the community in between Kings Cross and Euston. So quite possibly you've walked through there. Um, and that's an issue for them. They've got lots of people walking through there. It's also an issue for them is that that whole area is like a massive site for infrastructure development in London. And they've been going through it since High Speed One at St Pancras. They've had British Museum, British, uh, sorry, British Library, the Crick Institute, big cancer research institute is also in their neighbourhood. Now they've got HS2. Uh, HS2 will also come along with a redevelopment of the station and new residential. Uh, it's then Crossrail too, like the next big underground line is going to have a new station. So like it's never ending for them. Massive disruption. Uh, and also it's an area of poor air quality, uh, area of multiple deprivation in terms of uh, people living there uh, don't have great life outcomes uh, and opportunities. So it's one of those places where, you know, the, infra the infrastructure there benefits hugely people like me who, you know, catch the train to Manchester or to Paris and, you know, I live a great life. Um, but the people who pay the price for all of that disruption, you know, really don't travel by train outside London very much. Um, so they're not getting that kind of extra economic and social and cultural benefit from people just walking through their neighbourhood from one train station to the other. Uh, UCL has more or less ignored that community for many years, but over recent years we've been making much more of an effort to try and get to know our neighbours and to be a good neighbour. And my colleague Jane Holder in uh, Laws um, with the Environmental Law Foundation ran an environmental justice uh, inquiry and worked with people to see, well, what are their kind of experiences of environmental um, problems? What impacts does that have on their lives? And uh, lack of access to green space um, and air quality came up as big issues. So we kind of participated in that process and then took up the air quality uh, line of work because that was something that as engineers we felt like we could contribute something to. Um, so, and then the Summerstown Neighbourhood Forum, I'm not sure if those of you are aware of the Localism Act and its changes to planning, but um, now there is this thing called a neighbourhood plan. So, neighbourhoods can form a neighbourhood forum uh, and then come up with your own neighbourhood plan for that area and that becomes a kind of lowest level of planning uh, in the um, English planning system. Um, so, Summerstown Neighbourhood Forum were, they have a uh, neighbourhood plan, they uh, were looking to renew it and they wanted to increase air quality measures within that plan and document. And this is really important because when a new developer comes along or a new infrastructure provider comes along, they have to show that they're responding to whatever requirements are in the neighbourhood plan. But the challenge for Residence is that it has to that has to be compatible with the higher levels of plans, and so it has to be feasible and be able to be uh, to be accepted as as a feasible plan that people should comply with. Um, so we ran through. So so that's what I mean. In this case, it wasn't necessarily infrastructure that we were looking at. We were looking at what should they include in their neighbourhood plan. Um, but then that links into again sort of technical data and knowledge uh, and analysis. So ELD, three series of workshops, uh, start with, you know, generally, what do you care about? What are your issues? What are you most concerned about? Um, looking at reviews of evidence and kind of technical input. And then the third workshop of what do we actually, what are the outcomes of that? And what are, what are we going to take forward in our plan? Uh, so this, so there was some work that we did around actually what is the air quality situation and um, how bad is it? And uh, actually for some of the data, it's not as bad as people necessarily thought. There's a lot people can get very anxious about uh, air quality. And so um, knowing that things are getting better in some places rather than worse. 
so, and then looking at, well, what are the sources of pollution within that area? Because those are the things that they might be able to have some influence over in the planning process. Uh, making some, uh, within their plan, some recommendations for what should be included in air quality assessments and air quality impact statements. Um, and how should, uh, how should monitor, what, what kinds of questions you need to be asking of modelling data and model kind of setup that consultants might run on behalf of the local authority or a developer. Um, but may not actually be following best practice in, in air quality monitoring. So, and we, um, Claire Holman is an air quality consultant part-time uh, at UCL. And so she did what was very useful for residents, a review of all of the air quality impact statements that had been uh, done recently, comparing them both to best practice in terms of actually doing that work, um, and to what were the actual outcomes, how, how well did it match reality. And so that um, gave some reassurance that on the whole things were being done well, but there are a couple of cases where she was quite critical of saying, you know, this wasn't good enough and the council should have taken a harder line. And so then that gives residents uh, evidence to be able to hold their local authority and developers to account. Uh, and so then they came up with some, out of that process, some recommendations which Summerstown have been able to take into their neighbourhood plan. But Actually, the bigger impact has been in that, you know, boost in their own kind of technical competence and their own capacity to be able to be taken seriously um, by the people who typically have the numbers, the developers, the council. And our third uh, case study is uh, part of Camellia. So this is the overall vision for the Camellia program. Uh, and it's very ambitious, it's trying to deal with all of London and everybody who uh, uses and manages water has a particular focus on housing, of saying how is London going to meet its housing targets um, and uh, deliver water to all those people and uh, make them not uh, flood. So, uh, so that's a, like a big deal and it's a really complex issue for London to be able to do that. Um, but the idea was, rather than again, you know, thinking that we can all get all the kind of experts around the table and, you know, the Council of Elders will come up with a wise decision and um, or everyone will come together and integrate London's water, um, which has never happened, is never going to happen, certainly not going to happen in London. I don't know if it could happen anywhere. Um, you know, there is no catchment god. There is no one entity or one council that can make these integrated decisions as much as we might think we've got the science to inform that process. So again, we've said, well, why don't we just start down the bottom, which is where people are. They want houses. They want their city to be green. They want not to flood. And, and start, start with that. Start with what's already going on, what people already want. Bring the science into that kind of um, those processes and see if that can have uh, I guess, an emergent uh, effect. There is, you know, systems thinking behind that. We do have system dynamics um, colleagues who will be working as part of that process. So there is, you know, classic, uh, well, not just engineering, but systems thinking in there. Um, but the work that we're, the, the first kind of case study that we have delivered is uh, of uh, neighbours of the uh, Meekin estate on Kipling, um, and those residents wanted to design a roof garden. So you can see that there is a big concrete square. It's about 40 by 40 metres. It's quite a big area. Uh, and it's all concrete. And though, those are two tower blocks. Underneath the concrete is a garage. So it's not, that's not ground level. That's actually a roof. Um, and so, and we'll see, you can sort of see it there. So this is the garages underneath. This is a tower block here and the second tower block is over here. When this was originally designed, really nice concept, tower blocks and then uh, on the second floor of the tower blocks are uh, what was intended to be after school clubs, these nice little social areas. Kids could come home from school, 
go to the school clubs and then spill out onto this open garden area uh, as a play area. For various reasons which are not unfamiliar to social housing uh, situations, they didn't work out, it's been closed, uh, closed off and has just been this kind of ugly concrete area that people want to turn into a garden. So we said, that's great. Um, what if we design that as, like a, as a rain garden effectively? Can you, so firstly the residents were like, well, if we're gonna have a garden, how are we gonna irrigate it? So we need a water supply. And then we said, mm, well, if you put a garden on there and you take that amount of concrete out of that neighbor, out of the drainage network there, that's a significant benefit to what is an incredibly congested set of drains uh, in that part of London that will struggle to cope with the very high housing targets and the in intense development that's going on in Southwark. Uh, so we thought, what if we bring those kind of two sets of interests together? And then again, what if we help residents with some actual calculations about rainwater, drainage, irrigation, so that when they're designing their garden for what they want it to be, uh, it's also having some extra benefits. And then someone like Thames Water might actually pay for it because it, that garden then becomes an actual piece of useful infrastructure in helping to, maintain, to manage drainage networks in London. So the magic three workshops, um, discussing our values and so on, looking at what are some options, and then coming to a more kind of detailed uh, view. And in this case, we didn't, we tried, we brought more of the kind of infrastructure concepts in, but we didn't have anything kind of calculator-ish until the final workshop. Uh, so our, the kind of things we did in our first workshop, we took people on an infrastructure safari. There were two groups, worked better in one group than another, um, where we got people out, we asked them to talk about how does water work here. So people could say that car park floods, uh, that, um, you know, that's where our drinking water comes from and so forth. And we also had other stakeholders like someone from the council or from Thames Water. We went up into the tower blocks and then they could say, oh, see that, that's a green roof. This is what a green roof does. So we could um, let people talk about, they told us about their neighbourhood um, and other stakeholders could tell them about more technical stuff that was going on. Uh, and then we went through a, a particular kind of process about values and people said, the things that they wanted most was to be able to grow stuff. They want to improve biodiversity. They want wildlife, bees and birds, but they definitely do not want this space to be open to others. That's really important in terms of funding this kind of project because there is funding available to do urban greening projects if you make it publicly accessible. These people don't want all of the members of the public uh, coming onto their garden. So then that constrains their options for how they might fund this and then actually makes it more attract, gives them more incentive to demonstrate the water benefits of that because then Thames Water, who don't care or actually prefer to not have the public accessing their rain garden, uh, might be more interested in funding it. Uh, then in our work, second workshop, we had some physical models and we ran some more games. Um, we had Professor Adrian Butler from Imperial doing this most excellent demonstration of attenuation involving some baking trays and tea towels. Um, then again, in between the workshops, in this case, this is a project that actually the residents are going to do. And we were very conscious that we needed to step back and let them come up with an organisational structure that will see that project through. So in between, they've been going and visiting different um, gardens, getting their own kind of capacity to organise as a gardening group to be able to deliver the project. Again, we installed, and in fact, we moved the Meekin tank, never got used after, everybody said they were proud to have the tank on their estate, no one used it. We know that partly because Pete was collecting the data. Um, we, so we repurposed that tank to demonstrate rainwater on the uh, Kipling estate. Um, and there are some concerns, so we did remove it and it was vandalised within like a matter of days. So we've had to move it again. But um, then the third workshop, we went to have a look at that prototype. We took people up on the roof and 
we had we drew square um, scales that then corresponded to our piece of software had square blocks so that people could get a sense of scale in real space and then into software space. Uh, we had a piece of software that people then, a drag and drop kind of idea that you can drag in green roof elements, you can drag in raised bed elements, you can drag in social space elements and the calculator then tells you how much water will you need to irrigate that and then also what's the attenuation benefit of that and the attenuation benefit might be might help you to get some funding for the project. Uh, since then, that garden has started to be built. Residents have actually put in two funding applications, one to the GLA, uh, Greater London Authority, one to Southwark. Um, and we've had interest where we're looking at moving further into Southwark, this time not with one community garden, but with a network of community gardens in Walworth. Uh, so, yeah, just to sum up, I mentioned very briefly, but we're kind of, we are out of time. Um, we have been trying to evaluate throughout the process, but there are still some big gaps in our evaluation and we're still looking at developing new tools to be able to get to not just, you know, people have a nice time and do they like the sandwiches, but um, are we actually changing their understanding of the system? And then is that having an impact on their own behaviour and their own decisions in their own lives. That's the kind of thing that we would hope to get to. Um, you know, the, the next step is replicating rather than scaling up, I think is probably a better way of thinking about these tools. How do we get them so that they might be used more broadly, that they can be more affordably used by um, funders, infrastructure managers, designers, uh, and you may or may not have noticed there's not been a lot of theory in my kind of show and tell here. So we also, uh, um, you know, partly that's Charlotte's role in the project is to actually look at these theories of infrastructure, th you know, theories of environmental and urban change, as well as theories of design and how does that fit into what we're doing here. So going back to our overall point about bottom-up infrastructure is that these infrastructure kind of moments provide us with spaces for intervention uh, and for retrofit in really kind of interesting and creative ways that can then deliver multiple benefits. It's not just about, you know, getting the more resilient uh, system. <clears throat> it's about creating neighbourhoods uh, that people want to live in. Uh, it also can help to uh, improve citizens' capacity to hold their local representatives, their local government, uh, developers, other agents to account. So um, it's democratising technical knowledge, which I think is really important. Um, and it can be a new mechanism for, so Thames Water and the GLA are interested in these kinds of processes because it would be impossible for them to just knock on the door of Leather Market Chamber and say, can I take that concrete space out of the drainage network by putting um, a green roof on. Whereas this enables people to then start to come to them to say, oh, we think that we might be able to help you with an infrastructure problem that you have. And I think that's it. Thanks.